Okay, and that's the fourth day of the conference. And we have a Mark Ross again, and uh, he will talk about uh, the higher dimensional tropical vertex. Okay, well, um, thank you again for the, the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, so this is, um, well, the abbreviation usually is HDTV. This is in the tradition that um, this generalizes GPS and therefore should also have an acronym named after a consumer electronics product. Uh, so what is the goal here? So we've already heard, uh, I believe, uh, about the two-dimensional results, so generalized GPS. So we're going to get a little bit of review of GPS along the way, simply because uh, uh, GPS will turn out to be a special case of the, the uh, this more general situation. Uh, so GPS ultimately allowed us to compute the well, what we now describe as the canonical scattering diagram for a blow ups of uh, toric surfaces. Um, and so the generalization here, so maybe I should uh, be more specific, i.e. Uh, construct uh, canonical scattering diagrams in the sense that Baron talked about. For certain kinds of blow ups of torque bodies. Okay, and when I say construct, I, what I mean is I want an algorithmic method of, of constructing the or calculating canonical scattering diagrams, uh, for example, that can actually be put on a computer and indeed has been put on a computer. Uh, okay, so what is the basic setup for us? So let's fix a projective torque body. Uh, which I'll write as x sigma with fan sigma in a vector space uh, MR. So here M is a rank n lattice. So it's the n-dimensional projective torque product. Um, now let's fix also some rays in the fan, fix rays row one through row s in sigma. And of course, a ray in a torque variety corresponds to a divisor, a torus invariant divisor. Which I'll write as d row one through d row s inside x sigma. And then finally, let's choose. I'll just put the word general in here in quotes because I don't want to say exactly what I mean. General smooth hypersurfaces. Uh, H1 through HS uh, with HI a hypersurface in D row I. Now, just to make life uh, a bit easier for us, let's assume, but this is not, uh, I'll actually violate this assumption at certain points, but um, let's assume that the D, these divisors D row I are always disjoint. Okay, so we're put, choosing some disjoint uh, toric boundary divisors. We're choosing smooth hypersurfaces inside those. Um, and then what I want to do is I want to blow up those smooth hypersurfaces. So those are bit of mesh too. Uh, let x x sigma be the blow up of uh, the union of these smooth hypersurfaces. And now we'll take D to be the strict transform.
of the torque boundary. of x sigma. And then xd is a log lobby out there. So in particular, kx plus d is, is 0. OK, so as we know, when we have a log lobby out pair, we might want to do things like do this mirror using scattering diagrams. Uh, so the goal here is to do the scattering diagram for, for xd. Now, I should comment that in dimension two, every Leininga pair is of this form, is obtained up to maybe some um, torque bulbs, is obtained by starting with the torque surface and blowing up some, uh, some points on the boundary. Uh, so this is essentially complete story in dimension two. Dimension three or higher, there's, there are many examples of log clobby out pairs, which are definitely not of this form, are not bulbs or torque bodies. Uh, for example, it'll, you can find a, on a cubic threefold, you can find a, 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 maybe after a little bit of, uh, of resolute of blow ups, you can um, get a log club, you have a pair structure on it. And since the cubic threefold isn't rational, there's no way it's obtained in this way. So, in higher dimension, this is unfortunately somewhat restrictive. And, um, uh, but you know, that's life, we can't compute every single example. Uh, but still, one should view these these torque cases as these bulbs of torque cases, the most fundamental examples. So we want canonical scattering diagram of the pair XD. So this is defined by. Parent in a second talk. Okay, so let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, the first example will be a surface example. Let's take sigma to be this fan. So x looks something like, uh, sorry, this is not what I'm. Uh, Wanted my arrows to go that way. Uh, otherwise, I'll have to be modifying every picture that I drew in my notes. So here is X is uh, some torque surface. Here's growth surface uh, F1. And I want to blow up two points. Or this is X sigma. I want to blow up two points. That will be my hypersurface on here and here. So my rays are rho one, rho two. And the hypersurfaces are uh, two points. Okay, so when we do the blow up, we're just going to get something that looks like that. Okay, so that's the first example. I'm going to actually use this example to illustrate the ideas in the, uh, in the lecture because I can't draw many three-dimensional pictures. So as a second example, I want to give a three-dimensional example. Let's just take P3 and take H1 and H2 to be disjoint lines. Contained in two different planes, two different coordinate planes. Now, this actually doesn't fit that assumption because the two coordinate planes will intersect. Again, let me try to draw P3 as a, um, a tetrahedron. So I have well, line meets each boundary. It's a bit hard to draw lines in this kind of picture, and that's not really tangent there. But I want to indicate the intersection, right? So the each a line in P two will intersect each of the coordinate lines. 
through uh, it precisely once transversely. Uh, so this might be H1 and this will be H2. Now, I really want to emphasize the point here that it's not so important that D1 and D2 are disjoint. What is important is that H1 and H2 are disjoint. If uh, they weren't disjoint, then I would have to choose some order in which to blow them up to get something smooth. And our theorems don't say anything about that case. That would be uh, interesting, but, but different case. Okay, so those are some simple examples to keep in mind. Okay, so let's recall we have the tropicalization of, of X. One of the important points, which I didn't need in yesterday's lecture, is that um, sigma of X carries A, or the support, so B being the support of sigma of X, carries a natural structure of integral f by manifold with singularities. And let me even just emphasize here, it's better than affine, it's actually linear. Uh, so you don't need affine transformation, coordinate transformations, but linear coordinate transformations. And the singular locus a priori is just the uh, union overall sigma and sigma of X of co-dimension two. Now, um, again, I think you, well, you, I think you've certainly seen this in, in dimension two already in the lectures. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen this in higher dimensions, so I should explain this and it's good review. Um, so, you know, the point is that we have a polyjoule cone complex and each cone itself is naturally sitting inside the vector space spanned by uh, the generators of the cone and as such has a linear structure while it's embedding in that, that, uh, that vector space. So the real issue becomes uh, what happens, let me try to draw a three-dimensional picture. Can we find a chart in a neighborhood of uh, say a co-dimensional one cone. So let rho in sigma of x give dimension n minus one. And this will be contained. So here this is rho. Let's different color this is rho. This will be contained in two maximal cones. And it'll be the intersection of two maximal cones, sigma and sigma prime. Uh, sigma sigma prime will be maximum. Now I want to define a chart from the interior of the union of sigma and sigma prime into Rn as follows. So let's use a basis E1 through EN for RN. And let me uh, give names the generators of these cones, sigma, sigma prime, and rho. So let DI1 star through DI n minus one star generate rho. And let, so to get sigma, I just have to add one more generator. DIN star and rho generate sigma and let DIN prime star and rho generate sigma prime. Okay, so now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tell you where each of these generators map to under psi rho. Those generators aren't actually contained in the interior, but who cares? We'll define it 
as a piecewise linear map, linear on sigma and sigma prime, by saying where the, the generators of sigma and sigma prime go. So we define psi rho of D i j star to be just e j. So we will just map uh, sigma to the standard sort of orthant, positive orthant of our n. And then the key things to tell you where the one remaining generator maps to, so d i n prime star. And as a formula for this, minus e n minus summation j equal one to n minus one of d i j dot d rho e j, where d rho, uh, this is the one dimensional stratum corresponding to rho. So this intersection number makes sense. This is divisor, this is one dimensional. So of course I can define this intersection number. Now, where does this come from? Well, what happens is that this identifies sigma union sigma prime uh, with a fan in Rn for which somehow locally, um, uh, along the, the one dimensional stratum, the torque variety corresponding to that fan uh, looks the same as a neighborhood of, uh, uh, sorry, what do I want to say? A neighborhood of, of the corresponding stern D rho in X. Now, this isn't precisely correct, but this works at the level of log structures. So, this choice. is canonical because if sigma rho is the fan consisting of um, uh, psi rho of sigma, psi rho prime of sigma, sorry, so is one plus rho prime, psi rho of sigma prime and their faces, then the log structure on the one dimensional, on the, the unique, well, I we should just say, well, the unique one dimensional stratum. Uh, let me just give this a name. Uh, the log structure on, um, let me call it D sub, uh, psi rho of rho contained inside x sigma rho. Uh, so this is the one dimensional stratum of this toric variety corresponding to the co-dimensional one cone psi rho of rho. This agrees with the log structure on D rho contained in X. In X. So here, uh, just remember any toric variety comes with the log structure uh, and it induces the log structure on this. And X comes with a log structure induced by the divisor D and restricting that log structure to D rho gives you the log structure on this. And in fact, those log schemes are isomorphic. Um, as a slightly stronger result, uh, with some negativity hypotheses. On intersection numbers, um, Nikes, Shu, and Yu show formal neighborhoods of D psi rho rho, D psi rho rho, and D rho are isomorphic. 
So that's a slightly stronger statement, but requires some, uh, these intersection numbers to be negative, as I recall. Uh, okay, so that's what makes this choice natural. So it really is describing locally what our, our F pair XD looks like as a toric variety on one dimensional spectrum. Okay, so again, just for the purpose of, of uh, being a bit gentle and, and reviewing, uh, if we go back to the first example I gave you, which was this thing here, what matters here is the intersection numbers of the boundary divisors, which are one minus two minus one minus two. And one way to think about this affine manifold with singularities is you just start, you pretend as if this was a toric variety. And if this was a toric variety with band, toric boundary D, given by D1 through D4, you would know, if you're experienced at toric geometry, you know how to write down the band. You would just start writing, uh, so this is one zero, this is zero one, uh, D, the location of D3 star would be determined uh, by the, the self intersection of D2. And that, in fact, will be minus one, two. The location of D4 star will be determined uh, by, again, the self intersection of D3 will be minus one, one. I can continue. Now I use location D1, the, the subsection D4 to figure out where D1 star is, not worrying about the fact that I already have D1 star over here and somehow I haven't gotten back to where I started. If this had been a chart rod, I would have gotten back to where I started. And then D2 star will go here, continuing along in this fashion, D2 star is two minus one. And now you observe that this cone here should be identified with this cone. So you have an affine linear transformation or just linear transformation, which identifies these two cones. So you paste together these two cones and get your, your affine or, or linear manifold. Right, and what that transformation is, we'll tell you the monodromy and the affine singularity at the origin here. So here we just have a singularity at the origin. That's the co-dimension two cones. Um, okay, so uh, again, if you're familiar with sort of Torah count calculations, this should all be fairly straightforward. I'm not going to draw the second example because I just can't draw three-dimensional uh, affine manifolds. Okay, so what is the key idea we're going to use? Uh, the key idea is to degenerate. Use a degeneration. Of XD. And this is actually a generalization of, degeneraliza of a degeneration used in GPS generalization. One used in GPS. Uh, which has the the property that it uh, we really pull apart the singularities. And I will explain in detail what this is. I need a lot of space for this. So what we'll do is we'll start with x sigma cross a1. Uh, so that obviously is a somewhat trivial degeneration over of x sigma over a one. Nothing interesting happens yet. I'm then going to. Uh, oops, sorry, what's that? Uh, x sigma tilde. So this is this is the blow up of the um, union i belong to s of d rho i cross zero. 
So we're going to blow up in the central fiber, we're going to blow up the uh, divisors, the boundary divisors in which our hypersurfaces live. So this is still a toric blow up. So there's some fan, which I'll give a hint of in a second. Uh, there's some fan sigma tilde, which describes this toric blow up. You can think of this as a deformation of the normal cone for the, uh, these divisors. The next step, which is going to get us to X tilde, uh, this is a blow up now of the strict transform of the union from I for one to S of HI cross A1. And so HI is a hypersurface in D row I. Uh, so that's co-dimension two in, in X sigma. Uh, so this product is, is co-dimension two in, in X sigma total. Okay, and then of course we get a composed map uh, down to A1 uh, and that's our degeneration. Let's so go to A1. Is our degeneration. And this comes with boundary the strict transform of D cross A1 union B fiber over zero. Okay, so X tilde, D tilde is another example, it's a non compact law Claudia. But being proper over A1, we actually can still um, still use all of the technology that, uh, that we developed. Okay, so this is our degeneration. What's X0 tilde? Uh, X0 tilde is the fiber over, um, over zero. Changing, we're not just taking the special fiber as the as the device. Uh, that's right. We need to also include the the old sort of horizontal um, boundary device uh, because otherwise the fibers wouldn't be log log. They would just be uh, negative cut out dimension. Okay, so again, let's do this in example one. Uh, so it's convenient. I mean, sigma tilde, I have a little bit of trouble drawing this because sigma tilde, sigma was a two-dimensional fan. Sigma tilde is now a three-dimensional fan, but it does come with a map uh, because you have the map to A1 and it's a toric map. There is a map of fans from sigma tilde to, to the fan for A1, namely, um, let's visualize sigma tilde by looking at the map sigma tilde to r greater than zero and drawing fiber over uh, one inside r greater than zero. Um, and this is a convenient way, to, as we'll see, it continues to be a convenient way to visualize things. So what happens is that you have the original fan at height one, but now this gets subdivided and it gets subdivided this way. So remember this was row one here and this was row two. Uh, so you just, and this distance here is one and this distance here is one. Okay, so it's not too hard if you're, again, if you're familiar with torque geometry and now had to do just do ordinary blow ups of, of um, uh, various sort of torque strata, and it's not too hard to work this out. So you should really think that sigma tilde is the cone over this.
put this at height one uh, and then take cones. Now the actual picture of the fiber x tilde zero. Well, we start with remember uh, x. The original trivial degeneration has all fibers being the toric variety x sigma. We're then supposed to blow up uh, this divisor and this divisor. Uh, so then the central fiber will look something like that. The second step, if you recall, is to blow up the strict transform of our hypersurfaces cross A1. Those strict transforms will intersect the central fiber at these points. So they have gotten moved away from this uh, copy of the toric variety. And now uh, we do that blow up and we get something like this. So we've degenerated um, uh, uh, X. Uh, or with degenerate X to the union of uh, a toric variety plus some blown up, blow, up, blow ups of scrolls. Okay, so that's our degeneration. And those of you familiar with uh, the arguments in GPS will, will recognize this. But one of the points is that we also get um, a uh, I mean, this is still a log bar B I, so we still get a uh, integral affine manifold, or what's singular, it's integral linear manifold. So x tilde d tilde is an n plus one dimensional integral affine manifold. Again, that means emphasizes linear. So I'll call it B tilde. And again, because tropicalization is functorial, it comes with a map to the tropicalization of A1, which is, is the ray. Uh, so you fit. With, with a map, with a uh, affine submersion or linear submersion. B tilde to R greater equal to zero. And again, it's convenient to visualize this uh, by thinking about uh, the fiber at one. That'd be, let's write B tilde one is fiber over one. Now, this will be an actual affine manifold with singular, integral affine manifold with singularities, which I think someone has abbreviated as I am this um, Okay, so I think that's an awkward abbreviation because it's also a brand of dog food. Okay, so let's go back to this picture. So essentially this, this picture here, is what B tilde one looks like, uh, except it has some singularities in the affine structure. And the singularities uh, occur here and here. If you think of the cone over this, what's happening is, maybe I'll try to draw it like this, is that at height zero, we just have, maybe I should also say this, and so it's down here, B tilde zero, the fiber over zero, is actually equal to our original B. Uh, so you can think of this whole thing as somehow being a deformation, a perturbation of the original manifold B. And what's happening is at height zero, where we just had um, this fan, let's try to draw this as dots so the picture doesn't become too complicated. Uh, what's happening is that the actual discriminant, discriminant locus inside this three-dimensional integral affine manifold with singularities is two rays. Those rays converge at the origin at height zero, but what's happening is at all. They, uh, you know, what we're doing is we're pulling apart this complicated singularity into some simpler singularities. And if you went to, to greater height, 
what would happen is that these blue singularities would get pulled out towards infinity. So sort of asymptotically, we just get a, um, a vector space. Uh, so that's what I mean is that this degeneration actually affects for us the pulling part of these singularities. And you can think of this pulling part as, as being more or less equivalent information to expressing this flawed property. Yeah, well, XD is, is a torque flow. Okay. So that's the picture of the, the key degeneration. Now, we also have a canonical scattering diagram. We have, let me write as D canonical XD, but it's the canonical scattering diagram. Uh, for XD. And this lives on D tilde zero. Because that's the same thing as B. And the canonical scattering diagram for X tilde D tilde uh, living on uh, B tilde. Okay, now um, there are a couple points. Uh, first of all, all the, the directions on walls of D uh, tan X tilde D tilde are tangent. to fibers of this projection, B tilde to R greater equal to zero. So let me just briefly recall uh, what I mean by direction. What is a wall? A wall is some cone, uh, some polygonal cone, equipped with some, uh, some function F of say Z to the M for some monomial. Um, and this has direction in can think of M as being a tangent vector. Okay, um, so I can actually view, this actually allows me to restrict the, the uh, scattering diagram Uh, to B1, B tilde 1. And I don't actually lose any information in doing that. Uh, I'll, I'll draw a few pictures in, in a second. Another point is that D con of XD, uh, well, actually, let me say a bit more here. I can restrict this to any, any height. So R and R greater equal to zero. Uh, so D con of XD is the restriction of D conical X tilde D tilde to B tilde zero. And this is essentially kind of deformation invariance of, of puncture invariance. And the final point is that uh, D canonical X tilde D tilde uh, can be recovered from its restriction to B tilde one. So let me try to illustrate what I mean. So if I go back to this picture, which I'm going to redraw here, of the um, in, of B tilde one. So 
So restricting the scattering diagram means intersecting the walls of the scattering diagram with B tilde one. So I might get things like say this, and I can recover, so that's a, a one-dimensional wall, but I can recover the corresponding two-dimensional wall just by taking the cone over it. And again, this picture is sitting at height one, it makes sense to take the cone over that. And similarly, if I take a different, different wall, let's take uh, maybe this whole ray could be a wall. And if I take the cone over that, I actually get uh, at height zero, I get still a whole ray. So there's another wall, but that wall now intersects in some non-trivial way with the height zero piece, the B tilde zero. And so that gives you a wall in the canonical scaling diagram for X B. The first wall that you drew also extends to infinity. It doesn't uh, so I want to think of, I'm using the convention that walls um, are always contained inside polyhedra of, the, the, of sigma of X. Uh, so yes, you know, you're right in the sense that eventually we are going to add more walls that go off to infinity. Uh, but this would happen actually in three steps. I would have a step like that, and then another step uh, that goes off to infinity that way. And this would be three walls, even though the function would be the same. Um, okay, so. The point now is really to understand what the scattering diagram is restricted to B tilde one. Um, and the, the ingredients to this, the two key points, first of all, we want to understand what happens at the discriminant locus. On B tilde one and two, we want to understand what happens at the origin. So that's already hinted at in this picture. So I just use red for some more rays. So the point is that somehow life is pretty simple near the singularities themselves. Um, it's possible to argue uh, essentially a pure thought argument involving the fact that the canonical scattering diagram is consistent it's essentially possible to argue exactly what walls are allowed to come out of the singularity. And you find that these walls have to just come out of these lines uh, out in, in these this privileged direction. Uh, and similarly, we have a wall coming this way and then out that way. Now, what happens at the origin is we have to get some kind of scattering. We have to, we're supposed to have a consistent scattering diagram here. Which means, I think, as, as you probably saw in some earlier talks, that there's some um, consistency condition that composition of automorphisms around the origin uh, is the identity. And to accomplish that, you run this so called conservative Solomon algorithm, and this will sort of introduce new walls that go out to infinity and then maybe a whole slew of other walls. Uh, so what goes here, I mean, what extra walls have to be added here? Once you know what's coming in uh, from these singularities, what you have to do here is completely dictated by consistency and the consider solving the algorithm. But, but when you say, when you say uh, like canonical scattering diagram or canonical walls, is this the one generated by some initial walls or something? Or is no, so, so the canonical scattering diagram is the thing that Berndt wrote down in his, at the very end of his lecture. I actually said all, what all the walls, what all the walls are in terms of some function uh, count. Exactly, so, so for each of these walls, there's, there's some, uh, some function invariant which is contributing to it. But sort of the, yeah. That we're taking for granted. Like, That's right. Yeah. 
yeah, so so we're we're using the the um, the work of Barron to um, uh, so the canonical wall structure is consistent. And once we accept that it's consistent, then we know, I mean, we, we know two things. One is we can actually argue what happens near these singularities uh, because that's essentially dictated by what the monodromy around the singularity is. And then we only have to, the only place in this two-dimensional case anything else can happen is where these two walls collide. And then consistency tells us is there's no singularity here that um, the conservative solve in that algorithm applies. This is very stupid problem, but so the concept is going on that it's, it should extend to higher dimensions. I thought that was more like a two dimensional. Uh, yeah, so, so there is a higher dimensional version of this, and I think that's what I'm going to get to next. But we don't need that here because we essentially we still have the walls are still two dimensional. Right? They're still, even though um, we can what they are from the two dimensional slides. Uh, yeah, so, so this picture here is still two dimensional. But of course, if you want to go to higher dimensions, you need a higher dimensional version. Yeah, let me. Um, uh, let me let me say a bit more, and then maybe we return to that question if it's not clear. I, I don't know. Can, can you can you repeat? You couldn't understand. Uh, sorry. You couldn't understand. He said you remember the question. It's not clear. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So let me sort of explain. So. Essentially, this describes, so this is going to describe, this will give initial walls at the origin. Uh, because as I say, you know, something is going to be produced here will come out and hit the origin. And this will be taken care of uh, by sort of conservative solvent or generalization or a GS generalization in higher dimension. Okay, so uh, let me try to summarize now uh, what we actually end up getting. Okay, so for each, so what's happening at the origin, notice there's no singularity. Uh, at the origin. So you know, locally, I can just think of this as a copy of the vector space MR. So locally at origin, so we describe this as follows. Since there's no singularity at the origin, Scattering diagram can be viewed as lying in MR locally near the org. Another way to think about this is imagine that instead of working on B tilde one, you let the, the value of one go to, go to infinity so that these these singular points get pulled out further and further. And eventually all you see is a copy of MR with, um, with the fan, the sigma uh, still sitting there. So uh, for big values of one, um, the, uh, uh, we really just are seeing MR with, uh, with the fan. Um, so for each, Uh, say tau containing rho i with tau in sigma uh, co-dimension of tau equals one. Let's define a weight. So this is w sub i tau is defined to be the number of points of the hypersurface h i. Remember that's sitting inside the, the divisor corresponding to rho i. Uh, intersect it with the 
um, uh, the notation of those. This is the stratum. Stratum of the toric body X sigma corresponding to tau. Uh, maybe I call that D tau, but uh, anyway, I'm here now. Okay, so that's a curve. We're just counting the number of intersection points of the hypersurface of the curve. The hypersurface is general, so it's a transverse intersection. Okay, so now define a widget. Um, I think this is one of these words that I gave it the name widget uh, a long time ago and thinking that I would replace it with a better name and I never did. And Hoya seemed to be happy with the name. And here, uh, MI is a, is a primitive generator of rho i. Okay, so this is a wall. The support of the wall is just the codimensional one cone tau it's in the fan. And the function attached to the wall, I'm here using some auxiliary parameters, ti. Uh, let's not worry too much about that. Um, but the uh, the main point is we have this uh, power of one plus z to the mi given by this uh, this weight, and then I'll define the incoming uh, scattering diagram is well right as d in is the union of these di. So it's a union of widgets. Okay, uh, so in the two-dimensional example, this would be just something like, uh, sorry, it's, uh, Would be something like this. So this would be one plus um, y to the minus. Uh, sorry, it's one plus y inverse squared, and then one plus x inverse squared. Okay. So then there's a generalization. So um, parent and I had a higher dimensional generalization of the conservative Sogman algorithm. Um, this gives a um, consistent scattering diagram. Um, uh, D containing D in. Uh, this generalizes Yeah, so this, in a sense of this is already in our, our 2007 paper uh, from affine geometry to complex geometry, um, but it's an essentially impossible to extract from that paper. So, so Huli and I give a precise description of this algorithm and why it works in our paper. Okay, so in of course, in this project example, you would extend these rays, you get more rays, and then you have some additional, uh, somewhat complicated set of rays here, which I won't go into. Okay, so you know the main theorem is that from this, we can reconstruct. Uh, D, and this is the main theorem of the paper I'm talking about. Uh, we can reconstruct the canonical scattering diagram of XD uh, from this scattering diagram just described here. 
So we start with this collection of widgets, we scatter, and uh, that's that can all be put on a computer. Okay, so I have five minutes, and now I'm going to uh, any questions so far because I want to now show try to explain a three dimensional example. And for this, I'm going to switch to, to slides that Julia uh, provided. In this quickly, so, so I, I think in order to interpret what this initial lines generate as some kind of counts, you have to define functions. Right? This is one, one reason. That's right. So these things, I mean, it's not too hard to explain. Um, so in the, let me go back to, to um, Uh, this picture here, right? Because here's the central fiber. So those initial rays uh, actually correspond to multiple covers of this curve. And those have to be thought of as punctured curves because this curve will actually, it will have some point of contact order with the divisor containing it, which is negative. But, but then why, how come in the first tropical vertex papers, the GPS paper, how, how could you avoid talking about? Okay, yeah. So the reason is that in the canonical scattering diagram in two dimensions, it's not too hard to see that uh, there are no contributions from negative contact orders. So you know what we did over here in the two in, in the original GPS, we used a you know Jun Lee style degeneration um, formula gluing formula to analyze what was going on here. And you know, somehow the modern point of view on that in terms of log geometry actually does involve punctured invariants, but uh, it's just invisible. I mean, there was no log geometry in the, in the GPS. So you know, if you wanted to if you had some curve, let me see, suppose you had a curve like this. Um, the way Jun Lee would think about splitting this curve is you have three different curves, each lying in a uh, in a pair, right? So this would be a relative invariant, this is our sort of relative, uh, uh, relative stable map, this would be a relative stable map, this would be a relative stable map. If on the other hand, we take the the induced log structure here from x tilde d tilde. And we just restrict, uh, and we take this whole curve, that's a nice log curve, no negative contact orders, there's no contact orders, there's no marked points. But then we restrict to one of the compounds, we will have a negative contact order. It will be functional. So I, I don't know if that, that helps, but. Um, but the higher dimensional. Picture, you have to make sense of each individual piece. Yeah, so so in in higher dimensions, um, there's no way. Um, yeah, so so if we don't exactly, yeah. So something I don't have a good example. I I think we'll get to an example shortly. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure, but let me pass to to um, Julia's uh, slides. And, uh... So, so this is now the. Um... Uh, I should go back one more step here. Uh, so this is an example two that I talked about that I didn't draw any pictures for. We're taking P three. We're blowing up uh, two disjoint lines contained in in corner planes. So this first picture shows the two widgets. Uh, and these are, you, know, you can think of these as, as um, tropicalized line. So the usual picture of uh, tropical line cross, uh, well, if we continue these off in the other direction, they cross R. So that's what these widgets look like. All right, now here's what happens uh, once you go through this this um, generalized conservative Sutherland scattering that, that Bernd and I developed, and um, this was a calculation carried out by Julia and I, I think with Tom Coates. Um, 
And it's actually pretty, in, in some sense, it's fairly simple in the sense that we can write this down with only a, a small set of walls. And one of the things that happens is that you get these widgets just continue on through, as, as you would expect. There's some scattering of this blue, uh, blue wall with the red wall. What's interesting is this wall here, uh, and there's one that you can't see in this picture behind it, which corresponds to these two walls here. And notice these functions are not, they don't have a well-defined direction. The reason is that these walls actually really are an infinite number of walls sitting on top of each other. That these things emerge as an infinite product of, um, of functions. And what they represent is really quite, uh, quite complicated. So um, I think what I'll do is just, uh, since I'm out of time, I'll just, just very quickly indicate the kind of, kind of punctured curve that, uh, that will show up uh, in these contributions. Uh, so here's one type of, of map. Uh, so here we start with this green line here, which is now a red line in, um, in P3, sitting in the plane containing the line L1. And I want that line to go through this point and to go and meet L2 over here. Okay, so that uniquely determines that line. Uh, so now I do the blow ups and um, I take a straight transform of that, that line. So that this one I'll be still con containing the boundary. Now, one thing we can do is we can then take a multiple cover of that line. And that's what this picture here is representing. Take a, a K to one cover. Notice that this is going to give me if E1 and E2 are the classes of the exceptional fibers of the exceptional divisors. This will be the class of the strict transform. A green line. So we take a K to one cover. But then what I can do is notice that this, um, there's one point of intersection here uh, with the line we blew up. And what I can do is I can just add some collection of copies of the exceptional curve sitting over uh, that point. Um, so you know, it's uh, the common torques of this is quite complicated in the sense that you get many, many different contributions, but the actual curves aren't, aren't so, so bad. And these curves do have, uh, I believe they have a, um, all right, um, no, maybe, maybe not. Maybe these, these are still don't require punctures. Uh, so there's another type, which is a, a bit more complicated where we add uh, add another component. So this picture here is essentially the picture we had on the other page, uh, but we also have an extra curve here, which goes to the, the, the bulk of the um, uh, of the P3, uh, isn't containing the boundary, but meets L2 at one point, so that when we blow up L2, it, that curve no longer meets the boundary, yeah, except over here. Okay, so it's a somewhat complicated picture. Um, requires some some thinking about uh, and of course you from here you can add those copies of e1 to get lots of different possible curves so you have some very you know lots and lots of possible curves but their total contribution turns out to be fairly simple okay so i, I think i'll stop there okay yes thank you much Any question from the room? Maybe could I just make a small remark? Apologies. Yeah, no. um, I think I think um, yeah. And, and, <clears throat> Sorry, in this example, because all walls and family walls cancel, it's difficult to see the puncture things. I just wanted to remind in your paper with Bernd, there is actually a primitive example where you do see why punctures occur. So 
if you if you start with um, DP7, start with P2 blown up at two toric points. Um, if you can draw the fan of DP7. Yeah, yeah, why don't I, um, it's probably easier for me since I have control of the screen. Let me, let me draw this. Yes. Um, so, so if you draw the momentum point of DP7, P2 blown up at two points. So what I'll do is draw some. Two toric down. points. So I think it is P1 cross yes. P2 blown up at the Yes. Point. If you multiply it with P1 and if you, uh, yes, up. exactly. Uh, yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, that's right. I'm trying to do this in perspective. Let's see. Yeah, if you done if you blow up a copy of P1 and one of the P1 times P1 um, things. Yeah, so I'm going to blow up this. Exactly. Color. And then, um, yeah, and then you see um, if you draw the slice of the canonical scattering diagram, you see you need to have like walls formed by um, curves which go and stop. So having punctured point means um, you go your tropical curve. So usually what, what does contact order mean? Your tropic, you read the contact order of it's a marked point. If your curve um, lies on some cone, um, if the contact order, you can read it off. And if your curve goes and hits the boundary of another cone, it means you have some punctured point, exactly. So may, may, I just wanted to point this example. Yeah, Sorry, so let me, again, example. since I have control of, of the drawing, uh, let me try to draw this picture. So um, there is, so in this very simple example, what are the curves that contribute to the scattering diagram? Uh, so first of all, you have multiple covers of one of these exceptional curves. Uh, and that contributes these two walls here. Either multiple cover of this will contribute this wall, and multiple cover of this one over here will contribute this one. The other kind of, uh, okay, so then another um, curve is the strict transform of curve that's in the back face of this. It goes like that, and that corresponds to this wall. That just meets, um, meets this divisor transversely. But in the front, you have something more interesting because you have a curve like this. Uh, and that corresponds to this wall is again, you know, this curve here deforms and degenerates to this curve, which is reducible here. But in order to get this wall, you need to use um, you need to use this piece of the curve. And that's genuinely punctured. There's no way around that. Um, and I think that was one of the key insights early on in sort of developing the higher dimension canonical scattering diagram was realizing that you had to include these negative contact order things to get something consistent. Any question? I mean, do we have any guess why we want to, like, when you exponentiate, why do they come to such simple expressions? Uh, I, I don't. I mean, it, it's, it's certainly very fascinating. Uh, and I suspect there's a reason for it that we don't understand yet. Uh, we see these things also in the so called flat slab functions of. Um, in my, my 2007 paper with Berndt, um, we, we see these kinds of expressions, things like one plus X plus Y as starting data in more complicated situations. And um, I think we, we, I don't feel like we've really truly understood that yet. Yeah. Any question from Lou? Let's take one here.